So, good morning, everyone. Um, so yes, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to uh, speak a little bit about Plasmodium vivax, and I think it fits quite well uh, for for this conference because that infection for a very long time was considered to be benign and consequently was completely neglected in science, medicine, and, and public health. Um, that has changed recently, but I think we are still living with the heritage of that, uh, of that thinking, uh, thinking for, for the time being. So uh, latest estimates from WHO for PVIVAX are eight and a half million cases. This is approximately 11% of all malaria infection worldwide and a bit more than 300 deaths, approximately 1% of all malaria deaths. What those numbers mean is that actually half of the malaria cases outside of Sub-Saharan Africa are PVIVAX infections. The ge geographical spread of this species is so wide that it actually puts still one third of the world population at risk of infection. And this is actually without taking into account the fact that uh, prevalence is probably much more higher in Africa than, than what we typically think. Um, in terms of pathophysiology, the PVIVAX infection are now recognized to be also uh, able to lead to a CV malaria and complication. Actually, looking at the, the rate of, um, of uh, CV malaria in hospitalized pa patients, we can see that it's similar to, uh, to the one we see with falciparum. Um, the other point to make is that actually PVIVAX is now the, the unique or the main cause of uh, malaria in the majority of the countries that are currently eliminating malaria. I think what this shows is that, first of all, the spread of this species is wide, as I was just saying, but also the, it shows that this species is much more resilient than falciparum to our current anti-malarial intervention. And I think one of the, one of the reasons for that is that most of the intervention that we have today, they, are they have been primarily designed for falciparum and repurposed for uh, Vivax. And clearly this is, this is not good enough. Um, why this is not good enough is, 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 is because there are a number of uh, specific biological threats uh, of Vivax that I'll come to in a, in a minute, but clearly what we see now is that PVIVAX is a roadblock on the way to malaria elimination and that it needs specific solution to be developed to, uh, to address that. Um, so yeah, what I was talking about the specificity of PVIVAX. One of them is that it preferentially infects reticulocytes, young red blood cells, which are in limited numbers. This means that parasitemia at presentation in, um, in, in clinical cases of malaria of PVIVAX are typically uh, three to four times lower than for pifalciparum. See, so if you want to be able to diagnose uh, the same proportion of, the, of clinical cases than for pifalciparum, you actually need to be at least three to four times better for PVIVAX. Um, another point is that uh, gametocytes, sexual parasites, they appear simultaneously than, uh, than asexual parasites in the course of a blood stage infection. So if you want a chance to, uh, to uh, be able to uh, block transmission, that means that it's very important to diagnose early. So once again, you need to be even more sensitive than for, for P. falciparum in, the, in that case. And the last point I want to make is that um, the vast majority of blood stage PVIVAX infection, they're actually not coming from a, a primary infection, but that they, they are relapses mm, from uh, resting liver stages parasite hypnozoites. And so, uh, it is possible to, uh, to do a radical cure, meaning removing not only blood stage parasite, but also liver stage parasite. But uh, currently, this is, this is complicated to do in a safe and effective manner. Turning to, uh, to diagnostics for PVIVAX, I'm, I'm bringing up this uh, iceberg analogy where the top part, the part that is emerging from the water, is what you get to see. These are clinical cases, people you would see because they are sick. And they uh, and they go to uh, and they seek healthcare, um, and the, and the, the part under the water is the part that you wouldn't see because these are asymptomatic infections, so people you would not get to see unless you start to actively uh, look for them. So uh, looking at symptomatic infection, the what we have are uh, rapid diagnostic tests. Uh, for uh, PVIVAX, we have only one antigen that allows to uh, univocally diagnose a PVIVAX infection. 
that is PLDH. Um, but PLDH-based RDT are actually of uh, limited sensitivity. We have recently looked at that, and we have we have seen that the best best in class PLDH RDT tend to be uh, five to six times less sensitive than the best in class uh, PFALCIPARAM uh, RDT. There are also some uh, technical issues with those RDT specificity issues, stability issues. And there are actually very few uh, options for, for this kind of test. If you look at the 12 RDT that are WHO pre-qualified, only two of them can detect PVIVAX. The other uh, option is, of course, microscopy. But we all know that there as well, the sensitivity is limited. Um, it is known also that in area of co-endemicity, people tend to preferentially report a falciparum infection because it's, uh, it is more severe and there, there is a fear of missing a falciparum infection. And we know that with microscopy, there is a, if, you, if you want to maintain microscopy at a good quality level, it takes a lot of efforts in terms of quality control, quality assurance. Um, moving, uh, diving below the water, the situation is even worse. Um, we actually know now that the majority of all blood stage PVIVAX infection are actually asymptomatic. Most of them are uh, with parasitemia that are below the detection limit of microscopy. And there is currently no simple point of care test to, uh, to diagnose those, those infections. And when we think about uh, hypnozoide, those, those uh, resting liver stage parasites, there is simply no way to, uh, to identify them. Um, so uh, we think that clearly we need better, better diagnostic tests for, for PVIVAX, and this is one of, uh, one of our objectives in the malaria program at FINE, is to support the development of improved diagnostic tests for non-falciparum malaria. And so the first step we have, we have taken into that direction is to, is to work on target product profile, actually. There are a number of TPPs that have been developed for malaria diagnostic tests, but actually up to now, there were none that were specifically addressing the, the PVIVAX question. Um, so we set out to, uh, to do that, and we, we uh, initiated discussion with a relatively large group of experts a bit more than a, a year and a half ago. Um, and we had a, a consultative process to first actually identify what are the needs, and then sec secondly, build TPP based on those needs. Uh, and so we could recently publish those TPPs that are consensus-based in, uh, in, uh, in PLOS NTD. And um, what we came up with are TPPs uh, with minimal and optimal value for uh, 38 different characteristics that relate to uh, technical performances, operational performances, and, 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 and financial uh, aspects. And one important point is that we've been trying to do these TPPs in a in a technology-independent manner, not saying that we need a lateral flow assay or we need a PCR, but to make them as universal as possible so that we can use them as a tool to evaluate any new and, and, and coming technology and, and, and try to evaluate how well it address the needs that we've been able to identify. Um, so as a very brief uh, overview, we came up with three uh, different TPPs, and I'm coming back to this iceberg analogy to illustrate how they fit into, into that landscape. The first one, which we termed PVA, is uh, actually for clinical cases. So this is for parasitological confirmation of symptomatic suspected cases of PVIVAX. And uh, this, this test would be to guide individual treatment in passive case detection. Then uh, a second TPP called PVB1 is then is then trying to capture not only the symptomatic cases, but also these asymptomatic cases, so um, with a much better uh, sensitivity. And um, it would have to do so in a point-of-care manner also because that kind of test would be used to guide uh, individual treatment in active case detection uh, intervention. Then the third and last one, PVB2, is actually trying to capture the same um, the same infection, asymptomatic, asymptomatic, but that would be more for uh, surveillance purposes. So the main difference is that it would not necessarily need to be a point of care test uh, because it would be it would serve to inform epidemiological survey, guide population intervention, but not guide individual treatment. So I don't I don't really have the time to uh, to start uh, discussing the minimal optimal uh, characteristic value that we have defined for 
for all those TPPs. Um, but um, well, first, if, if you are interested about them, as I said, this has been published, so please go look at them, and, and if you have comments or questions, feel free to reach out to me. The, the goal of those TPPs was, is also to actually start maybe a broader discussion about the, the needs and the, and, the, and the value that we, uh, that we propose. So please, please do so. And then what I, what I would like to do now for the next couple of minutes is actually look at what are the current best fit for those TPPs and, and what could be potential future solutions. Um, so for PVA, the, the clinical case uh, test, basically what we have at the moment is what I, I just described before, so rapid diagnostic test and microscopy. We know that at least RDT are simple, affordable, they are easy to use in a point of care manner. But I was saying they are not really, uh, they, they don't have a, a good se a sensitivity good enough. They have some uh, quality issue and, and, and uh, clearly they're not, well, they, they, they're not good enough. So what could be potential future solution? Well, a, a simple first solution would be to try to improve the sensitivity of, of diagnostic test, of, of RDT, sorry. And so uh, we think that a, a five to ten fold, a, a rapid diagnostic test with a five to ten fold improved analytical sensitivity would be, would be already uh, uh, something uh, quite desirable that could start to make a difference. Um, thinking about PVB1, so a test that would, that would need to capture not only symptomatic but also asymptomatic cases. We don't really have any standardized solution at the moment. So people have been using mobile laboratory equipped with PCR. People have been develop, uh, developing um, custom-made uh, lamp assay, for example, but uh, none of that is standardized. So, of course, one advantage of those kind of solutions is the throughput. You can test a lot of people if you do a, a screen and treat campaign, for example. But it, this is costly. It is not standardized. It is not fully a uh, point of care. So none of that is really, none of this you could really bring up to scale. Um, Potential solution could be a commercial lamp kit that is specifically designed for PVIVAX or a high, what we, could, what we would call a high sensitivity RDT that, it would, that is then 50 200, with a 50 to 100 fold better uh, analytical sensitivity. For PVB2, a surveillance test, um, there are a number of uh, high tech PCR protocol with uh, very, very good detection limits. So, Analytical sensitivity is great, throughput is great, but again, these are, these are much more research-based uh, assets that are not standardized uh, at all and that are very costly and, and, and complex. So uh, potential solution for, for that TPP are uh, maybe serology-based approach uh, or standardized uh, PCR kits. Um, so, we are actually working on the, on the maturity of those potential future solutions, but I also want to make the point that we are welcoming any, uh, any uh, solution proposal and that we have a, a dedicated process for that. So if any of you has a bright idea or, or a good technology and think that this could address one of those TPP I just mentioned, please uh, go on and, and submit your solution to, to, to uh, our website. We have a transparent and standardized process to evaluate those submissions that could potentially lead to um, new project and new collaborations. So in summary, I think we understand now that PVIVAX is not a, a benign infection, but most importantly that it requires dedicated solution to be developed and reproposing what exists for falciparum is simply not, not good enough anymore. Um, we crucially need new di diagnostics for, for that species. We have started working on this by developing a target product profile that uh, are intended to answer to uh, the needs we've been identifying for, for these species. Uh, in the collaboration with a large group of experts, we came up with those three different TPPs that, that I just mentioned, and we are now actively working on solution to, uh, to um, well, um, developing solution to uh, fit those, t those TPPs. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I also want to acknowledge the, the donors that, that supported this work. Thank you very much.